only three sims this time, so it should be a short of it. Hi, and welcome back to Shakespeare and Veronavel, the series where we talk about Veronavel lore and the Shakespeare plays that inspired it. This is episode 5. If you're new to the series, you might want to check out the previous episodes before watching this one. A link to the playlist will be in the description. If you don't have time for that, that's fine. To be honest, each of these episodes can stand on its own, for the most part. We're really starting to draw links between all the various species of lore gathered along the way, so if you care about theories on Veronaville's overall storyline, it's probably best if you watch the episodes in order. Real quick before we start, I am now active on Tumblr. <laughs> Whoa, look at me bravely stepping into the 2010s. So you can follow me on there and see all the pretty screenshots that I've been taking while making the Shakespeare and Veronaville videos. And of course I'm going to post more as the series progresses and maybe other Sims related stuff as well. And if you want to get in touch somewhere that's not in the YouTube comments, you can message me on there. But enough about that, let's get into today's play, which is The Merchant of Venice. The Merchant of Venice is a comedy that Shakespeare wrote between 1596 and 1599. It features the characters of Antonio, Bassanio, and Portia. The text I'm going to be quoting from is a modern English translation of the play that was made by Matt Cosby. It's available on the charts. During my research, I watched a performance by the UMass Hillel Jewish Theatre Collective and the Massachusetts Center for Renaissance Studies. It was directed by Dory A. Robinson. I also watched the 2004 movie The Merchant of Venice, directed by Michael Redford. The play is a comedy, but the movie played it as a drama, which actually makes a lot of sense. You will understand why shortly. All relevant links are in the description as always. The play starts in Venice, as you might expect. Antonio, a prominent Venetian merchant, is talking with his friends Salerio and Solano. He's in a melancholic mood, but can't pinpoint where his sadness comes from. His friends assume that he must be worrying about the ships that he sent on a big trade venture and other possible dangers that they could encounter at sea, but he assures them that no, even if something were to happen at sea, he doesn't have all of his merchandise in the same basket, so to speak, so he's not too worried. Enter Bassanio, Gratiano, and Lorenzo. All three are friends of Antonio's. Salario and Solano leave the four men alone, and Gratiano and Lorenzo soon leave as well, but we already get a good idea of Gratiano's personality from this first introduction. He's a cheery guy who's very talkative. He encourages Antonio to shake off his sadness. Then he and Lorenzo bid Antonio and Bassanio goodbye and promise to meet again later for dinner. Bassanio has come to Antonio because he needs his help. He's fallen in love with a lady who lives in the city of Belmont. Her name is Portia, and she's utmostly beautiful, virtuous, and rich, to the point that the competition to become her husband is very fierce. And so Bassanio needs to borrow Antonio money to be able to compete with those many suitors. He borrowed money from Antonio before and wasn't able to pay him back, but he promises that this time will be different. In any case, Antonio reassures Bassanio that he doesn't resent that he hasn't been able to repay him and he's ready to lend him more money, no problem. The only issue is that Antonio doesn't have any money to lend at the moment because everything he has is currently at sea in the big trade venture that we talked about earlier. So instead of giving money to Bassanio directly, he tells him to go ask around Venice who would be willing to be his creditor in Antonio's name. Since Antonio is a reputable merchant, he expects that it shouldn't be too hard to find someone that trusts him. Meanwhile, in Belmont, Portia is talking with her maid Nerissa. Portia's father died recently and left her a fortune, but he specified in his will that he doesn't want his daughter to just be able to choose the husband she wants. He set up a challenge that her suitors will have to go through, and whoever wins the challenge will marry Portia. Actually, rather than a challenge, Portia and Nerissa call it a lottery, which is more accurate really, because luck is kind of the main factor here. The suitors have to choose between a casket made of gold a casket made of silver, and one made of lead. The winning casket is the one that has a picture of Portia inside it. The first person who chooses correctly wins Portia's hand, but anyone who chooses wrong has to leave immediately and vow never to marry anyone. Portia is justifiably worried that the winner might not be someone she wants to be married to. She reviews the suitors that she's met so far. There's the Prince of Naples, the Count Palatine, the French Lord Monsieur Le Bon, the English Baron Falconbridge, a Scottish Lord, and the German Duke of Saxony. She despises them all, but Nerissa says that luckily none of them are willing to play her father's game and they're all going back home. 
Then there is uh, asks Portia if she remembers a gentleman that she met when she went to Venice with her father. And Portia is instantly able to remember him and that his name was Bassanio. He apparently made a very good impression on her. Then we get back to Bassanio, who's trying to get a man called Shylock to lend him money. Shylock is Jewish, and that's a pretty big deal in the play. Venice is majority Christians, and fierce anti-Semitism is the norm. Bassanio tells Shylock that he needs to borrow 3,000 ducats for three months, with Antonio as a guarantor. Shylock isn't exactly thrilled, because although Antonio has a good reputation as a merchant, he's been very disrespectful towards Shylock in the past, because Antonio has no respect for Jewish people. Also, Antonio usually lends money without charging interests, while Shylock does charge interests, but Antonio's competition forces him to lower them. As you can imagine, Shylock's character is in large part based on anti-Semitic tropes. As Shylock and Bassanio are talking, Antonio comes in to see what's up. Shylock is still hesitant to lend Bassanio money because he's not too keen on helping out a friend of his enemy. So yeah, these two do not get along. But in the end, Shylock accepts to lend the money, and without interest even, on one condition. If Antonio isn't able to pay him back on time, he will have to have a pound of his flesh cut off from whichever part of his body Shylock chooses. Bassanio is pretty horrified by the proposition, and he turns to Antonio to say, don't do it. But Antonio says that no, it's fine, he'll gladly accept the condition. He tells Bassanio that he doesn't expect that he'll have to give a pound of his flesh anyway because his trading ships will be back before the expiration of the lease and he'll have more than enough money to repay his debt by that time. So they go to the notary's office to officialize their agreement. Then we're introduced to Lancelot, who is a servant of Shylock. He's obviously not very fond of Shylock, who he calls the Devil Incarnate, and so he's decided to leave Shylock's house and go to Bassanio to offer his services to him instead. Bassanio, being the nice guy that he is, accepts and even gives him new clothes. Lancelot thanks him very much and takes his leave. Then Gratiano comes to talk to Bassanio. Bassanio is soon going to travel to Belmont to see Portia, and Gratiano asks if it would be okay if he went with him as well. Bassanio accepts on the condition that Gratiano hold his tongue and watch his manners while they're in Belmont, because he doesn't want Gratiano's usual wild behavior to reflect poorly on him and ruin his chances with Portia. Gratiano promises that he'll be careful. Then we meet Jessica, who is Shylock's daughter. She's talking to Lancelot, who just informed her that he's leaving Shylock's service. She's sad to see him go because he brought a bit of joy in the house. Jessica is miserable living with her father. She even says, our house is hell. As the last thing he'll do for her, she asked Lancelot to give a letter to Lorenzo, the friend of Antonio and Bassanio that we saw at the start of the play. Lorenzo will be at the dinner at Bassanio's house that night, so Lancelot will be able to give him the letter then. Lancelot takes the letter and goes, although he's sad to leave Jessica there with her tyrannical father. Jessica is ashamed that she hates her father so much. She calls it a sin, but she really does not want anything to do with him, and she's hoping that Lorenzo will keep the promise he made to marry her so she can escape and become a Christian. 
While Lorenzo is talking with his friends, uh, Graziano, Salario, and Solano, Lancelot comes in and goes to Lorenzo to give him Jessica's letter. Lorenzo asks him to tell Jessica that he will keep his promise to her. Lancelot goes back to Shylock's house to carry his message. Salario and Solano leave as well to prepare for dinner so that only Lorenzo and Graziano remain. Graziano asks Lorenzo about the letter and uh, Lorenzo reveals that it contains instructions from Jessica on how he's going to be able to take her away from Shylock's house. Lorenzo and Jessica are obviously very much in love and both eager to get away from her dad so they can get married. At Shylock's house, Lancelot informs Shylock that he's invited to dinner at Bassanio's and that there will be a masquerade party. Shylock is reluctant to go, especially because of the masquerade, which he seems to consider very foolish and immoral, but he does decide to accept the invitation. Before going, he asks Jessica to lock herself up and to not look out the window when she hears noise from the party outside. But in private, Lancelot tells her not to listen to her dad's warning, implying that Lorenzo is going to come to her while her father is absent. Later that evening, Lorenzo comes to Shylock's house with Graziano and Celario to get Jessica. Disguised as a boy, Jessica takes some money from the house and joins them outside. When Lorenzo and Jessica are gone, Antonio comes in and finds Graziano. He lets him know that Bassanio decided to sail to Belmont right away because the wind is so nice. So Graziano hurries to Bassanio's ship to depart with him as they agreed. That evening in Belmont, Portia receives the Prince of Morocco. He swears that he would accomplish all kinds of heroic acts to earn the right to marry her, and from what he says, he's a pretty accomplished warrior. But since the only way to become her husband is to play her father's game, he's willing to try his luck at it. Portia reminds him that if he does decide to make an attempt and chooses the wrong casket, he can never speak about marriage to a lady ever again. The prince decides to take the risk, and Portia invites him to choose a casket. The one made of gold bears an inscription saying, He who chooses me will get what many men desire. The one made of silver reads, He who chooses me will get as much as he deserves. And the one made of lead reads, he who chooses me must give up and risk all that he has. Portia tells the prince that if he chooses the casket that contains a picture of her, he gets to become her husband. The prince reasons that many men desire Portia, and besides, only the gold casket is worthy of encasing her picture, so he chooses the gold casket. But when he opens it, inside it is a skull, and a scroll that reads, All that glitters is not gold. Many a man has given up his life just to see my outside. But golden tombs contain nothing but worms. So the golden casket was the wrong one, and the prince has to give up his claim to Portia and go back home. Portia is relieved that he failed, and she makes a racist remark, wishing that all suitors who have the same skin tone as the prince of Morocco choose the wrong casket. We'll get back to Portia's racism in the analysis part. Back in Venice, Celario and Solano are gossiping about recent events. Bassanio and Gritiano are on their way to Belmont, while Lorenzo and Jessica have been seen on a gondola, but we don't know where they are now. Shylock is furious that his daughter escaped, that she escaped with the Christian, and to top it all off, that she took some of his money and jewels with her. Celerio reports that he heard that an Italian ship carrying merchandise was shipwrecked between France and England, and he hopes that it wasn't Antonio's. In Belmont, another suitor is introduced to Portia, the Prince of Aragon. Portia invites him to choose a casket. Like the Prince of Morocco, the Prince of Aragon discards the lead casket immediately, but he also doesn't pick the gold casket because he doesn't want to follow in the footsteps of many men, and be among the vulgar commoners, basically. He chooses the silver casket because he believes that he deserves to be Portia's husband and he believes in the idea of meritocracy in general. When he opens the silver casket though, he finds the portrait of an idiot with a message saying that he's a fool and he should leave. Again, Portia is relieved that he chose wrong. After the Prince of Aragon has left, a messenger comes to Portia to tell her that a young Venetian has come with great gifts to announce his master's arrival. Portia and Nerissa go meet the newcomer. 
In Venice, we find Salario and Solano exchanging gossip again. Salario heard of another shipwreck on the English Channel. The ship carried a lot of valuable merchandise and it's rumored to be one of Antonio's. Enter Shylock. He's pretty angry about his daughter running away and he berates Salario because Salario knew about her plan. Salario and Solano laugh in his face though. Shylock also heard the rumor about Antonio's ships and he calls him reckless with money. Salaria is like, but if he can't pay you back on time, you're not actually going to take a pound of his flesh, are you? Shylock says that yes, absolutely he will, because in itself that pound of flesh is worthless, but it will at least satisfy his desire for revenge. He says about Antonio. After Solari and Solano leave, a friend of Shylock named Tubal comes in. Shylock asks him if Jessica has been found, and she hasn't, but Tubal has heard rumors that she and Lorenzo are in Genoa, and that they are spending the money she took at an alarming rate, which makes Shylock furious. Tubal also confirms that Antonio lost a ship, and that he's most likely going to have to forfeit on his loan, to which Shylock replies, And he says that if Antonio can't pay him back, he will take his heart. In Belmont, Portia is talking with Bassanio finally. She obviously loves him very much, and she's scared that he might fail her father's test. The conditions of the casket test stipulate that she can't tell any of the suitors which is the right casket, but she's really tempted to break that rule and tell Bassanio anyway. She restrains herself, though. Bassanio completely returns Portia's affection, and he's also very scared to fail the test. Portia shows him the caskets, and after some deliberation, he comes to a decision. Bassanio opens the lead casket and finds the picture of Portia, as well as a scroll that reads, You who choose not based on appearances have good luck and chose correct. Since you have gained this fortune, be content and don't seek anything more. If this pleases you well and you are happy with your good fortune, turn to your lady and claim her with a loving kiss. Both Bassanio and Portia are overjoyed. Portia gives Bassanio a ring that she has him promise never to take half his finger. In the meantime, Gratiano and Nerissa have also fallen in love with each other, if it seems sudden that's because it is, and Bassanio invites them to get married during his and Portia's wedding feast. Enter Lorenzo, Jessica and Celario. Bassanio introduces them to Portia who welcomes them. Solario gives Bassanio a letter from Antonio. The letter says that Antonio's ships were somehow all lost in various accidents and he is now ruined and unable to pay back Shylock on time. Antonio also writes that this means that he's going to die, a reference to Shylock wanting to take his heart. He writes that Bassanio's debt is cleared so he shouldn't worry about that, but it would be nice if he could pay him a visit before he dies. 
Celerio adds that Shylock has become increasingly vindictive about getting justice, and he's constantly pleading his cause to the Duke of Venice. Jessica says that, in truth, even if Antonio were able to pay him back, Shylock would much rather have his flesh if the law allows it. Vesanio is very distressed, obviously. Um, Antonio is his close friend, and he certainly doesn't want him to die because of him. Portia asks what's going on, and Bassanio reveals to her that he's in fact extremely poor, and that he owes his dear friend Antonio all this money, and Antonio is going to be killed by his creditors soon because of him. Portia is 100% sympathetic, and she offers to repay Shylock with her money because she has a ton of it. After they go to the church to finalize their marriage, Portia's money will also belong to Bassanio anyway, so once that's done, Portia and Larissa urge Pisanio and Gritiano to go save Antonio while they wait in Belmont for their return. In Venice, Antonio has been put in jail. The jailer allows him to get out to talk to Shylock, but Shylock is completely inflexible and refuses to listen to him. Antonio, defeated, gives up and goes back to jail. All he hopes for now is to see Pisanio before he dies. In Belmont, Portia gives Lorenzo and Jessica authority over her household until Bassanio comes back. She says that she and Nerissa have made a vow to dedicate themselves to prayer and contemplation while their husbands are away, and so they are leaving for a monastery until their return. When Lorenzo and Jessica leave, Portia tells Nerissa that actually she has another plan. While they pretend to be at the monastery, they will actually travel to Venice in secret and disguise themselves as men so they can be with their husbands and be part of the action. Portia asks a servant to carry a letter to her cousin, Dr. Bellario, and to join them in Venice with what Dr. Bellario will give him. The servant goes to carry the letter and Portia and Nerissa hurry off to get ready to leave. In Venice, time has come for Antonio to face the consequences of his inability to pay Shylock on time. The two of them are gathered in the court of law with Bassanio, Gratiano, and Solario. The Duke of Venice is overseeing the execution of the legal contract that Antonio and Shylock signed. The Duke is definitely on Antonio's side, and the first thing he says to Shylock is that his eagerness to take Antonio's flesh is over the top and he should show mercy. But Shylock is inflexible, and he points out that he's completely within his right as per the contract Antonio and him agreed on, so the Duke is powerless. Bassanio offers to pay twice, even three times, the 3,000 ducats that Antonio owes, but Shylock refuses. At this point, he just really wants to cut Antonio up. The Duke asks him one more time to be merciful. The Duke can't really say anything to that. But swiftly changing the topic, um, he mentions that he sent for a doctor of law called Bellario to come and give his opinion on the case. Salerio tells him that a messenger of Bellario has arrived and they have him come in. The messenger is in fact Nerissa, disguised as a law clerk. Nerissa announces that Bellario couldn't make it because he's sick, but in his place, he sent a very wise young doctor of law who's more than capable of dealing with Antonio and Shylock's case. This young doctor's name is Balthazar. They have him come in and, oh surprise, Balthazar is in fact Portia, also wearing a disguise and fooling everyone. She comes forward and addresses Antonio and Shylock. Antonio confesses that he broke their agreement and Portia recommends Shylock show mercy, which he again refuses to do. Pisanio begs Shylock to take his money, even 10 times the amount he's owed, but it's useless. Pisanio then turns to Balthazar Portia 
to ask her to bend the law a little for the sake of Antonio, but Portia says that it's impossible. Upon hearing this, Shylock praises Balthazar profusely, like finally someone who agrees with me that the law must be applied to a T. One last time, Portia gives Shylock the option to tear up the agreement and just take the money that he's offered. But Shylock yet again refuses, so Portia orders that Antonio get his chest ready for Shylock's knife. Shylock is very happy and once again praises this very wise, very reasonable young judge here. Portia suggests that a doctor be called so that Antonio doesn't bleed to death. That would be the merciful thing to do, she says. But Shylock refuses because there's no mention of that in the agreement. So he gets ready to cut into Antonio's chest. But Portia stops him at the last minute to remind him of the literal words of the contract. Shylock only has the right to a pound of flesh. Nowhere is it mentioned that he can take any blood. Well, obviously you can't cut flesh out of someone without shedding any blood, so Shylock is a bit stuck there. To make fun of him, Gratiano starts praising Balthazar in the same elated way as Shylock was doing a minute ago when he thought the judge was on his side. So Shylock starts backtracking. He says that he'll take the money and let Antonio go. But Portia refuses. Shylock wanted to follow the letter of the law exactly, well, now he must have justice, as stipulated in the agreement. So of course Shylock doesn't even try, and he just wants to leave. But Portia stops him, because since Shylock is so hell-bent on following the law, she has another law for him. The Duke pardons Shylock right away before he even asks, and he highlights the difference between his mercy and Shylock's inflexible attitude towards Antonio. This whole scene really makes a point of associating mercy with the Christian faith and the Christian characters who are presented as morally superior, while the Jewish character is fundamentally incapable of being merciful even after all the chances that he was given. As the law that Portia mentioned says, everything that Shylock has has to be stripped away from him because he tried to kill Antonio, and Shylock doesn't want to be pardoned after that because he'd rather die than live with nothing. So Antonio makes an offer. Shylock can keep the half of his goods that the law says Antonio can have, but with the Duke's permission, Antonio would like to take the other half and invest it so that he can give it and the profits to Lorenzo, Shylock's son-in-law, upon Shylock's death. Antonio also requires two more things. One, that Shylock converts to Christianism. Um, quite painful to read. And two, that he writes a will saying that everything he owns has to go to Lorenzo and Jessica when he dies. The Duke says that Shylock has to comply or he'll retract his pardon and he'll be executed, so Shylock accepts and the case is settled. Shylock and the Duke leave, and Bassanio and Antonio express their gratitude to Balthazar, Portia. They offer her money and she declines, but they keep insisting that she takes something from them to remember them by. So Portia gives in. She takes Antonio's gloves, and from Bassanio she wants to take his ring, his wedding ring that he promised to never take off. Bassanio really doesn't want to give it up, and Balthazar Portia ends up leaving without it, but looking quite disgruntled. Antonio convinces him to let the ring go, and Bassanio asks Gratiano to run to Balthazar and give it to him. 
Gratiano catches up to Portia and Nerissa and gives the ring to Portia, who takes it. Nerissa is curious to see if Gratiano would also be willing to give the wedding ring that she gave him, and she decides to try to get him to offer it up as well before she and Portia go back to Belmont. Very early the next morning, at Portia's residence, Lorenzo and Jessica are flirting when a messenger comes in to announce that Portia and Nerissa are on their way. They indeed arrive soon afterwards, still pretending that they were at the monastery. And they barely have time to say hello before Bassanio, Antonio and Cristiano arrive back from Venice as well. Portia pretends that this is the first time she's seeing Antonio and she welcomes him. But they are quickly interrupted by Nerissa and Gratiano quarreling over the rank that Nerissa gave him. She says that she's angry that he gave it away, and he explains that he felt obliged to give it to Dr. Balthazar's clerk to thank him for his services. But Nerissa pretends that she doesn't believe him, and that she thinks he must have given it to a woman. Borsha berates Gratiano as well, and says that if Bassanio had done the same thing, she would be angry too. So Bassanio is extremely embarrassed, and Graziano explains that they both had to give up their rings to Balthazar and his clerk because they saved Antonio's life, and the rings were the only thing that they would take as thanks. Portia and Nerissa pretend to be angry some more, and the men are very sorry, and they try to plead for their cause, until Portia finally whips out Bassanio's ring and asks Antonio to give it to Bassanio. She reveals that Balthazar and his clerk were in fact herself and Nerissa, and everyone is like, wow, that's insane, we had no idea it was you. Portia also has a letter for Antonio saying that three of his ships actually were not wrecked and they reached safe harbor with their merchandise intact. And Nerissa hands another document to Lorenzo, that's the will that Shylock signed saying that Lorenzo would inherit all of his wealth after his death. So everyone is super happy that everything is getting resolved so nicely, and that's the end of the play. The first thing we find out about Antonio's character in the play is that he's the brooding type. He's sad for no particular reason. When Gratiano tries to cheer him up, he says, Shakespeare and his contemporaries believed in the theory of the four bodily humors, the four fluids that were thought to be found in various proportions in people's bodies, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile, and people's temperaments were said to depend on how much of each of the humors they had. People whose dominant humor was blood were sanguine, energetic, and confident. Those whose dominant humor was phlegm were phlegmatic, so slow and unemotional, Yellow bile would make people choleric, prone to anger, and black bile would cause melancholia. Antonio seems to be a character whose dominant humor is black bile. He has a predisposition for sadness. The four humors were associated with elements, planets, seasons, and ages of a person's life. Black bile is typically associated with old age, so we can surmise that Shakespeare saw Antonio as an aging man. According to this article from the National Library of Medicine, Shylock could be interpreted as an extreme case of black bile dominance. And from what I've seen, Shylock is most often represented as an old man, including in the 2004 movie, where he's played by Al Pacino. So anyway, all of that to say that Antonio is naturally sad, so to speak, and most likely not a young man anymore. Antonio is framed as a sympathetic character, and there's no doubt that 16th century or 17th century audiences would have seen him as a good guy, but for the modern reader, his anti-Semitism is pretty abhorrent, not gonna lie. Shylock has very poignant tirades detailing how the Christians of Venice, and Antonio in particular, treat him. In the 2004 movie, which I recommend you watch if you have the time, the first thing they do as the movie starts is they give context about how Jewish people were treated by the Christian majority in Venice and in Europe. They were forced to live in ghettos that were locked by night. They had to wear a red hat when they were outside of the ghetto during the day so they could be easily identified. 
They were forbidden to own property, so they resorted to usury to make money, and then they were despised for charging interests, even if the system basically prompted them to. Of course, Shakespeare wasn't going to set the stage like that. The sort of anti-Semitic discrimination was taken for granted at that time. But I'm glad the movie added that. It was definitely important to contextualize the character of Shylock. And to be fair, Shakespeare's text does show that Shylock isn't just doing what he does because he's evil and that's it. Shylock gets to tell his side of the story to an extent, and he makes very good points. He's just not a two-dimensional caricature, he's fleshed out beyond that. The Christian bias is still strong, the play definitely reads more anti-Semitic than not, in my opinion, but it's something, I guess. When Antonio and Bassanio come to Shylock for money, he points out to Antonio that it's pretty jarring that he spits on him one day and asks him for money the next. In the movie, you actually see it. You see Antonio spit on Shylock's clothes, and it's much more impactful when you see it than when you just hear that it happened. It's such a disgusting, shameful thing to do, and he's so unapologetic about it. It's hard to overlook that side of Antonio after seeing the movie, and I'm glad they included it. The part that shocked me even more is at the end when Portia saves Antonio from Shylock's knife, and Antonio forces Shylock to convert to Christianism. I don't even need to be religious to feel how deeply wrong that was. You, you can't force someone to give up their religion and adhere to another one that openly despises you. And again, the movie handled that part pretty well in my opinion. Not only was Shylock's reaction to being forced to convert very poignant, but also the movie shows at the very end what this means for Shylock in concrete terms. There's a brief but memorable scene where Shylock is standing outside under the pouring rain and his community closes the door on him, and you can really sense the extent of his loss. And in Antonio's mind, asking Shylock to become a Christian probably means ultimately saving him because Antonio believes in the Christian doctrine and believes that Jews are heretics. And so in his mind, making Shylock a Christian means putting him on the right path. Like, I'm sure that Antonio's intentions are good, I guess, in a very imperialistic, I know better kind of way. But holy shit, how misguided he is. So there's definitely a very unpleasant side to Antonio in the play. Apart from that, Antonio is a merchant, apparently a pretty rich one, given how many loaded ships he's sent all over the world. But unlike Shylock, he's not really overly concerned with money. He's not worried about his trade expedition, and he's very quick to lend money to Bassanio, even when Bassanio couldn't pay him back last time. So not a fortune aspiration character is where I'm getting at, but also his readiness to give money to Bassanio may be the sign of something else going on. Antonio likes Bassanio very much. When Bassanio comes to Antonio at the start of the play to borrow money from him, he prefaces it by saying, And then he talks about how he will be able to pay him back this time, like trying to be convincing. But Antonio replies... And you can tell that these two are very close. And I'm not the only one who thinks that. Apparently, Michael Radford agrees, because in the movie, there's clearly erotic tension between them in that scene. And they even kiss. And it feels so natural and makes so much sense. I don't know, I thought it was great. And that's not the only scene in the play that hints that Antonio and Bassanio have a relationship that goes beyond friendship. In the scene at the Court of Justice, where Shylock is set on cutting Antonio up, Bassanio is very passionate trying to save him. Multiple times, he offers Shylock the 3,000 ducats that he's owed, but even beyond that, the lines he has when he gets a chance to intervene are very powerful. He says to Antonio, and later to Shylock, and to the Duke.
and back to Antonio when things are really looking desperate. In that moment, Bassanio would choose Antonio over his wife, who he cherishes and loves very much as well. After Antonio was saved, he and Bassanio go to Balthazar to thank him, and Balthazar, Portia, asks Bassanio for the ring that she gave him and that she made him promise never to take off. Initially, Bassanio refuses, but then, as Balthazar is leaving, it's Antonio who convinces Bassanio to give it up. He says... Let my love outweigh your wife's command. And Bassanio gives in immediately, again choosing Antonio over Portia. And lastly, let's look at the final scene when everyone is in Belmont. Portia and Nerissa are pretending to be angry with their husbands because they've given away their rings, and Bassanio is trying his best to defend himself, but Portia doesn't reveal the truth until Antonio intervenes and says... Only when he says that, Portia takes out the ring that she was hiding, and what she does is, she doesn't give it directly to Bassanio, no, she gives it to Antonio, and she says... And Antonio goes to Bassanio and gives him the ring, saying... There's two layers to this exchange, there has to be. On the surface, Portia is sort of jokingly asking Antonio to be Bassanio's guarantor that he will keep his promise to never take off the ring again, in the same way that Antonio was Bassanio's guarantor for the lease to Shylock. And then Antonio asks Bassanio to swear that he will keep the ring, but we all know what the ring stands for, right? The ring is the symbol of Bassanio's fidelity to Portia. Earlier on, he took it off for the sake of Antonio, which symbolically showed his feelings for Antonio. He wasn't quite ready to commit 100% to Portia. He took off the ring because Antonio asked him to. But here, in this final scene, Portia is talking to Antonio as much as she's talking to Bassanio when she asks that her husband never take off the ring again. Because Portia knows, Portia has seen the tension between these two in court. She was there when Bassanio cried out that he was ready to give up everything, including her, to save Antonio. So in this scene, with the ring passing around the three of them, I think Portia is asking Bassanio to commit to her exclusively, but she's also asking Antonio to step back and let her relationship with Bassanio be exclusive. And Antonio is saying yes, that's what he means when he says, I'll wager my soul that your husband will never again break a promise to you. And then when he says to Bassanio, swear that you will keep this ring. He might not like that he has to give Bassanio up to her, but he also knows that it's the most reasonable thing to do for Bassanio as well. Because what else is he gonna do? Even if Bassanio didn't love Portia, which he does, there's no acceptance of gay relationships in that society. This is end of 16th century Europe they live in. So Antonio is kind of forced to give in, which is quite sad. If you want to see the dynamic of that three-way relationship in all its glorious subtlety, I really encourage you to watch the 2004 movie. And by the way, every line that the characters speak in that movie is Shakespeare's text. Nothing was added to the original play to make it more gay than it is. Everything was taken from Shakespeare. Did Shakespeare intend for this gay reading to be possible? I think so, yes. If you remember the Antonio from Twelfth Night, he also had a gay subtext. I think Shakespeare knew very well what he was doing. It's even argued that Shakespeare might have been gay himself. Just look it up and you'll see. Of course, there's a possibility that I'm just being overly enthusiastic here, but I do think he meant that subtext, both in Twelfth Night and in The Merchant of Venice. And of course, this can be translated into The Sims too. I'm not going to go over everything I said about the relationship between Antonio and Hero in the previous episode, um, but remember that Antonio does not have a memory of ever falling in love with Hero, so he might not even be attracted to women, we have free reign to imagine that. 
I didn't mention it in the last episode, but Antonio and Hero's marriage might have been an arranged marriage, like it was common in Shakespeare's time. Arranged marriages are very likely to have happened in the Cap family as well. We'll get to that eventually. So that's definitely a possibility for Antonio and Hero as well. And then of course, in The Sims, Antonio was never involved with Bassanio, because Bassanio is his great-grandfather, so we can't take Shakespeare that literally, but the points I made about Antonio and Bassanio's sexual orientations still stand. In The Sims 2, Antonio is a knowledge sim. As I mentioned in the previous episode, his bio hints that he could have a family secondary. In The Merchant of Venice, it's not very clear-cut which aspiration would fit Antonio best. Not fortune, not romance, probably not pleasure. There's no indication that he's particularly driven by knowledge, but his personality kind of corresponds to what you'd imagine a knowledge sim to be like, typically. He's serious and contemplative. As for the family aspiration, well, Antonio doesn't have a family. There is no mention of a spouse, children, or parents. The fact that he doesn't have a wife while he's coded as an aging man is one of the elements that make the theory that he's gay so plausible. Maybe he never had a wife, or maybe he's a widower, like seems to Antonio. You know, about the question of Antonio Monti's relationship with his deceased wife Hero, there's something I realized. Ideally, I should have mentioned it in the previous episode when talking about Hero, but it actually fits here as well. Antonio has the memory of having Beatrice and Benedict, and the Monty Tree says that he's their father, but he doesn't have a memory of ever woohooing with Hero, or with anyone for that matter. Is this an oversight, that question again? <laughs> or is this an element that reinforces my theory that Antonio and Hero weren't in love, and Hero was actually in love with Claudio? Because maybe Antonio isn't actually Beatrice and Benedict's biological father, maybe Claudio is. And we can't look at Hero and Claudio's memories to prove or disprove that, because they're both dead and they have none. So, I mean, it's possible. Genetically, it would kind of work. Beatrice and Benedict both have black hair and skin 3, same as Hero and Claudio. And Beatrice has brown eyes, like her mother, and Benedict has dark blue eyes that he probably inherited from his great-grandfather, Proteus. Guess who else has blue eyes, though? Claudio. Okay, Claudio has light blue eyes, which none of his ancestors have, by the way. But if you put dark blue and light blue in the same category, it could be a clue that Claudio is in fact the twin's father. Maybe this is too much of a stretch. I mean, I can't in good faith call this definite proof of anything, but it's possible. And if we hold Antonio's memories as accurate and he never had woohoo with Hero, then it would mean that he knows that Beatrice and Benedict are not his biological children. Like, he can't possibly have children if he's never woohooed. In fact, I think he not only knows, he may also have accepted it. This ties in with the arranged marriage theory. Maybe the whole family knew that Antonio was gay, and the fact that Hero gave birth to the twins was used to say to the rest of the town, look, he can't be gay, he's had children with his wife. Except in actuality, Claudio is the biological father and not him. This is a pretty dark theory because it relies on homophobia and the Monty clan wanting to hide Antonio's gayness. But it would kind of match the views on sexuality that were commonly held in Shakespeare's time. Looking at Sims 2 Antonio's personality, he's a bit on the neat side, a bit on the shy side, active and serious. This would fit Shakespeare's Antonio as well, I actually wouldn't change a thing there. Our first introduction to Portia is when Bassanio talks about her to Antonio. Being in love with her, he praises her very highly. I'm not gonna go into the details of the myth of Jason and the Golden Fleece, it's not that important here. The point is basically that Portia is supposed to have beautiful blonde hair. Oops. Portia's namesake, who was Cato's daughter and the wife of Brutus, is more relevant to talk about though. 
that Portia, more frequently spelt with a C, was a woman who lived in the 1st century BCE. Her husband, Brutus, is famous for being one of the people who assassinated Julius Caesar in 44 BCE. And would you look at that, in the Cap family, in the same generation as Portia and Bassanio, there's a guy called Julius Caesar. Coincidence? I think not. Could Portia Monti's husband, Bassanio, have killed Julius Caesar, the grandfather of Contessa Cap? Yeah! So that possibility is pretty interesting, right? Because Bassanio is the founder of the Monti clan, and so if the origins of the feud between the Montis and the Caps can be traced all the way back to him, well, it makes a lot of sense that the two families would have such a deep-seated hatred for each other. About the historical Portia, historians don't know for sure if she was aware of her husband's plot against Caesar. According to Plutarch, and I'm gonna quote the Wikipedia article on Portia here, she happened upon Brutus while he was pondering over what to do about Caesar and she asked him what was wrong. When he did not answer, she suspected that he distrusted her on account of her being a woman, for fear she might reveal something, however unwillingly, under torture. In order to prove herself to him, she secretly inflicted a wound upon her own thigh with a barber's knife to see if she could endure the pain. As a result of the wound, she suffered from violent pains, chills and fever. Some believe that she endured the pain of her untreated wound for at least a day. As soon as she overcame the pain, she returned to Brutus and said, You, my husband, though you trusted my spirit that it would not betray you, nevertheless were distrustful of my body and your feeling was but human, but I found that my body also can keep silence. Therefore fear not, but tell me all you are concealing from me, for neither fire nor lashes nor goats will force me to divulge your word. I was not born to that extent a woman. Hence, if you still distrust me, it is better for me to die than to live, otherwise let no one think me longer the daughter of Cato or your wife. Brutus marveled when he saw the gash on her thigh, and after hearing this, he no longer hid anything from her, but felt strengthened himself, and promised to relate the whole plot. Brutus also said about Portia, Though the natural weakness of her body hinders her from doing what only the strength of men can perform, she has a mind as valiant and active for the good of her country as the best of us. The story of this Portia is again reminiscent of the theme of the self-sacrificing woman who is all the more virtuous for it. However, Shakespeare's Portia doesn't describe to that model, I don't think. When we see her for the first time, she complains that she's subjected to her father's will, which leaves her powerless to choose the husband she wants, but as the play unfolds, she progressively takes back her agency. In fact, you could argue that, unlike the historical Portia, Shakespeare's Portia is more assertive and powerful than her husband. She's very rich, while Bassanio is very poor. She is able to save Antonio's life, while Bassanio is unable to. And she has power over Bassanio, which is shown symbolically through the ring that she gives him. Yes, Bassanio takes the ring off after Antonio convinces him to, but by the end of the play, Portia takes control back by making sure to have Antonio's word that he won't take her husband from her again. Portia is actually probably the most powerful character in the play by the end of it. The treatment of the female characters in this play is very interesting. Similarly to Portia, Nerissa also has some level of control over her husband with the ring that she gives him. In the last scene, when the two women buried Bassanio and Gratiano for giving away their rings, Portia and Nerissa are in control, while Bassanio and Gratiano are confused and dumbfounded. The ring as a symbol of power also comes up with the character of Jessica. I didn't mention it so far, but when she escapes from Shylock's house, among the money and jewels that she takes with her, she also takes a ring that she ends up exchanging for a monkey in Genoa. Like she gives the ring away as payment to have a pet monkey. Shylock says about the ring. We can assume that Leah was his wife and Jessica's mother. So Jessica taking the ring and giving it away is highly symbolic. She's throwing away the power that her father had over her. She's taking back her agency. So the women in this play are pretty empowered, all things considered. For the most part, Portia makes the modern reader want to root for her. With that said, I'm not going to gloss over her racism. 
To be fair, her attitude towards all of the suitors except the Bassanio is one of disdain. She doesn't like them and she freely mocks them behind their backs with Nerissa. For example, she hones in on the Prince of Naples' obsession with horses and she jokes that his mother might have had an affair with a blacksmith. Or she makes fun of the German lord for his drinking habit. Shakespeare often uses alcoholism as a comedic device, which is questionable, but where the Prince of Morocco is concerned, her mockery targets his skin color rather than his character or anything he's ever done. Before she even meets him, she says about him, and after he chose the wrong casket and he has to leave, she says, So I don't think Shakespeare meant her to be a vicious character in any way. Her prejudice was just the norm in Shakespeare's society, but obviously that doesn't make it excusable. In the movie, they erased Portia's racism completely. Those two lines I just quoted were dropped entirely. And I can understand why. Portia is a sympathetic character in all aspects, except for her racism. Having such a character be racist could be interpreted as condoning racism almost. Like, a character like her could not possibly be evil in any way, and therefore her views on race cannot be evil. That type of reasoning. Of course, that's not how things work. In real life, there are people who are racist, but are also very reasonable and virtuous on plenty of other fronts, and it doesn't excuse their racism in any way. But when it comes to fiction, you have to be very careful with the bundles of attributes that you give to your characters. When it comes to an attribute as vile as racism, you don't want to seem to be softening it or excusing it by having it coexist with overflowing virtues within the same character. Of course, for Shakespeare, that wasn't a concern here, because he probably didn't view racism as a flaw. But now that racism isn't accepted, or isn't as widely accepted, I should say, it's pretty much impossible to conceive of a character that you're supposed to root for it that is also openly racist like Portia is. Ideally, you'd be able to depict any type of character without the audience necessarily feeling that they have to root for or against them in a black and white type of way, but in this instance, Portia is quite clearly one of the good ones, as per Shakespeare's characterization of her, so I understand why the movie dropped her racism entirely. I don't know if it was the right thing to do, but I understand that it was the easier thing to do. Also, I think they wanted to keep the spotlight on the theme of anti-Semitism. Like, I think in this specific case, it's a defensible choice. But to be clear, as a general rule, I strongly believe that glossing over this sort of stuff is not good, it's not serving anyone. We don't want to be rewriting history because we are not comfortable with the way it is. So there you go, we are left in this uncomfortable state of cognitive dissonance, looking at a character who is good in many ways, but also a racist. But like, the thing is, and I'm so ashamed that I'm only taking in the full measure of that fact now, the vast majority of Shakespeare's characters are racist, even if they don't necessarily show it, at least if you value authorial intent, because obviously Shakespeare intended the vast majority of his characters to be somewhat similar to himself and other people from the society he was socialized in, because that's his bias. This is making me think of the much more recent debacle of J.K. Rowling turning out to be transphobic. If you want to be able to engage with the Harry Potter series and actually have fun doing it, you have to dissociate it from its author now and come up with your own head canons. It's the same with Shakespeare's plays. It's the same with, well, come to think of it, the majority of recorded European literature, because most of it is the product of white men full of their own specific set of prejudice. So you have to kill the author to an extent. Not literally, don't make any attempts against J.K. Rowling's life, I'm just referring to Roland Barthes. Maxis already did that to a degree in Veronavel by giving most of the Montes skin 3, which is probably not the skin tone that Shakespeare had in mind for most of his characters. But of course we can go much further and imagine whatever we want for these characters. This is The Sims, Veronavel is your oyster, just go off, basically. This whole series is about decrypting the clues and references that Max has put into Veronavel, so I'm not gonna sit here and say that authorial intent isn't interesting to me at all. I think it's fun to follow the breadcrumbs and find out what the developer's vision was for Veronavel and what Shakespeare's vision was for his plays, 
but these are works of fiction molded after their creators' minds, and I don't think these creators should be put on a pedestal, nor should their intent completely dictate how we enjoy their works. We can have our own interpretations based on our own values. To be fair, Verona Velour is so vague, we have plenty of room for interpretation anyway, so let's take advantage of it and play an active part in creating the lore ourselves. Maxis left so much to the imagination that the world building of Veronavel can be considered a collaborative effort between the devs and the players at this point. So I hope this doesn't sound cowardly, but I think that if you don't want any trace of bigotry in your game, you don't have to let any in. In The Sims 2, Portia is a deceased ancestor with a blank personality and the family aspiration. Shakespeare's Portia could have the family aspiration as well, maybe with a knowledge secondary because of how fruitfully she studied Venetian law to pass as Balthazar. As for her personality, it gave me a bit of a hard time because I feel like I would need to give her more than 25 points. When you create a sim in Cass, that's what you have, 25 points, so that's why I've been sticking to that amount every time I've translated a Shakespeare character's personality into the sim so far, even though there isn't an actual limit to how many personality points a sim can have, because you can always use the encourage interaction or cheats to give them more. But this time 25 points isn't really cutting it, so I'm gonna make an exception and give her more for the sake of accuracy. I'd say Portia is neither sloppy nor neat, more outgoing than shy, more active than lazy, more playful than serious, although she can be serious too, and in between grouchy and nice. Bassanio is probably the least controversial character of the three. He comes off as a nice guy overall, still a product of the anti-Semitic and racist society he lives in, let's not discount that, but we don't get to see that in him nearly as explicitly as in the other two. It's kind of hard to imagine him murdering Julius Caesar, but if Bassanio Monti was inspired not only by him, but also by the historical Brutus, then he could definitely have done it. As he's presented in The Merchant of Venice, Bassanio's only flaw is that he's bad with money. He lives above his means and has to take loans repeatedly. He likes to throw parties and have a good time with his friends, but he doesn't engage in over-the-top debauchery and his morals are never in question. He's much more mild-mannered than his friend Gretiano, for instance, and so he appears quite reasonable by contrast. The fact that he's successful at Portia's casket test also shines a positive light on his character. To be clear, the Prince of Morocco and the Prince of Naples also had sound lines of thinking for making the choices they made, but Bassanio's reasoning, based on the motto, appearances can be deceitful, is what awards him Portia's hand. And as Nerissa says at the start of the play, Portia's father was a good man, so passing the test that he designed has to count for something, I guess. It's kind of funny that the casket test is a lesson on not falling for appearances, but then Portia is said to be incredibly beautiful. I feel like this whole plotline would have made more sense if she was a plain-looking woman and a great person on the inside, in the same way that a plain-looking lead casket can have great things inside it. But as she's described, um, Portia is a stunningly beautiful lady who's pretty much the human equivalent of a gold casket from the outside. In The Sims 2, Bassanio, like Portia, is a deceased ancestor with a blank personality and the family aspiration. My first choice of aspiration for Shakespeare's Bassanio would have been popularity, but uh, family could suit him as well. You could imagine that he doesn't spend as much time with his friends and doesn't party as much after his marriage. His most salient personality trait is definitely his niceness, then he's also outgoing. There's nothing extreme when it comes to his other traits. So that was The Merchant of Venice. When I started the Shakespeare and Veronavel series, I didn't think it was going to be like this. I didn't think we were going to talk about such difficult, potentially upsetting topics so often. And this is only episode 5, and we've only looked at comedies so far. Comedies. I really thought it was just going to be relaxing and fun, how naive. <laughs> I mean, I'm still having fun making these, don't get me wrong, but the content I end up making is much heavier than I thought it would be. But I mean, of course, this is Shakespeare, we were gonna encounter difficult topics. I've been trying my best to talk about these things in an intelligent way, and I really hope that I've done a decent job so far. 
I'm putting a lot of effort into this whole thing, but I'm just one person and I'm trying my best to identify my biases and confront them, but there's no doubt that I'm going to be off sometimes because of blind spots that I don't even realize I have, or just because I'm not educated enough on certain things. My background is in languages and literature, and in studying languages and translation, I've lived abroad and I've been exposed to cultures outside of the one I was born in. I was born in a white middle class French family, but even if I've had the opportunity to see other parts of the world, I fully realize that my understanding of it is very limited. And I'm only 26, so yeah, I have a lot more to learn. As far as the difficult topics we tackle this time, anti-Semitism and racism, I want to make clear that I'm not Jewish and I'm white, so I'm probably not the best person to be talking about either and I would not have felt like it was my place to speak about these things in a video if it weren't for the fact that they're so integral to the play. Since I was going to make a video about The Merchant of Venice, I think glossing over those topics would have been impossible. So that's why I just dove in. But at the same time, I don't mean to present my perspective as gospel, and I would be more than happy to have your input, especially if you have first-hand experience with anti-Semitism and or racism. And on a side note, if you know the play or if you've watched the movie, I'd be happy to know what you think of the characterization of the Prince of Morocco, for instance. So yeah, I don't want to talk about myself too much in these videos, but if we're gonna talk about politics, I have to be honest and transparent about my identity, my biases, my process. I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. Anyway, that's gonna be the end of this episode. Next time, we're gonna talk about the taming of the shrew, because I've been wanting to get to Bianca. So The Taming of the Shrew has the characters of Bianca, Petruccio, Katharina, and there's a secondary character called Vincentio. There's another Bianca in Othello, so I'm going to read Othello as well, but I'll probably include my findings about Othello in the video on The Taming of the Shrew, just because Bianca is the only character of that play that appears in The Sims, and she's a secondary character, I believe, so I'm probably not going to make a whole video just for that. So I hope you'll come back for the next episode, and if so, I'll talk to you then. For now, have a good rest of your day, bye! But this time, 25 points isn't really cutting it. <laughs> Can you show up, please?